Okay. Hmm? On the book. Right, let's get rid of that. Right, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. In case you don't know me, uh, my name is Helen Snell, Chair of the SEBSID Board. I'll be taking you through the proceedings this evening, which should take about 30 minutes in terms of my presentation. We have 10 minutes for a guest speaker, the details of which will be revealed. And thereafter, we'll take any and all questions you may have within a reasonable time frame to not place undue demands on the school staff kindly accommodating us. As usual, we are joined by a representative from the CID department at the City of Cape Town, several other SEBSID board members, and we are due to be joined by both of our appointed political observers, namely uh, award councillor Roberto Quintus, uh, but he is running late, he's on his way, and we are also expecting potentially Alderman Zampia Limburg, who is the chair chairperson of Sub-Council 20, under which Hout Bay falls. And we do thank both of them for making time and their busy schedules to be here. So this is now our fourth such annual meeting, um, so the proceedings are no doubt getting very familiar to some of you, but of course each year we welcome new homeowners and new members, and therefore I will just repeat a few key points about the process. My presentation will be a recap of the efforts of our CID in the past year. We'll then run through a number of items on which members are asked to vote, and I stress the word members because due to the requirements of the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, homeowners must opt in to become members of our non-profit company before being allocated voting rights. Those of you who are members have had your membership status reviewed by both SEBSID and the City of Cape Town in advance of this meeting. And as you arrived, you've been given a voting form which indicates the number of votes you have according to your municipal property valuation. Please do remember to return those forms to us before you leave this evening. For the items on which we are voting, just tick whether you approve, object, or of course abstain on each item. And when the votes are counted, your preferences will be weighted by the votes we know you have. So moving on to the agenda, we will clarify membership statistics of our CID and confirm we have the required attendance either in person or via proxy to make this meeting core up, which reminds me to ask Caro to add up the members that we have in the room, please. I will give a report on the activities of the CID to date. We will review our financial position at the end of year three, talk through some of the key takeaways from the financial results. We'll then present the proposed budget for year five of our CID term and the implementation plan for the same period and ask you to vote to approve these and other financial items which I'll come on to describe. Likewise, uh, the appointment of our registered auditor and company secretary, and then the appointment of directors. And in an exciting new addition to the agenda this year, we will vote on the adoption of a new memorandum of incorporation proposed by the City of Cape Town, details of which I will come on to explain. So our membership figure has decreased slightly from 146 this time last year to 143 currently, but this reflects four new membership applications being offset by seven members leaving the area. So that still represents just under 30% of our property owners, which is a relatively high participation rate for CIDs. Thus, we require 20, 29 members attending to be core at this evening. We already have 55 proxies, which already comfortably qualifies us, but we'll update the, uh, the number of members in the room uh, at the end of the meeting. The board's efforts remain focused on the four key pillars of public safety, environmental improvement, urban maintenance, and social responsibility. And then, of course, governance, ensuring we manage this company in accordance with all relevant regulations, policies, and our community's expectations. And crucially, communications, ensuring all of you who contribute financially to this CID are kept comprehensively and regularly abreast of how funds are being deployed. In terms of governance and finance, there's little more to report than the most important news that we again achieved a completely clean audit in our third financial year. Gratitude is due to our treasurer, Alison Lowe, assisted by our accountant, Ros Akers. And the standard, <laughs> Take a bow. the standard declaration that all directors give of their time wholly voluntarily and freely. None of the directors are paid for any of the time or effort they contribute to the CID in any way, shape or form. Turning now to each of those four pillars. Firstly, public safety. We now have a total of 117 cameras in place. Despite it being approximately three years old, we still constantly monitor and reassess the camera network both in terms of the efficiency of what's already installed, but also plugging gaps, which inevitably do still occur. And the public safety directors of SEBSID, namely me, Fani Milan and Paul Maguire, still meet every month with Deep Blue, and remarkably, there's still always something to talk about. 
We've continued to switch out the basic IR cameras along the mountainside for MS lift thermals, taking advantage of the reducing cost of these cameras, which offer enhanced detection capabilities and longer range. The handful of pan tilt zoom or PTZ cameras we had in our network have now been upgraded to more effective panoramic cameras. And it's worth repeating the huge advantage of the nature of our contract with Deep Blue, which is based on a camera fee for an end-to-end -end public safety solution. And this enables us to switch cameras out at a moment's notice in this way. Our focus for a long time has, of course, been ensuring the cameras stay on during load shedding. I talked about this last year and report, reported how pleased we were to have been able to finally land on a solution for UPS, uninterruptible power supply, which has not only proven cost effective, but immensely reliable, even during the most intense periods of load shedding. And this has really been tested and proven this year. Credit is due to Deep Blue, who did the heavy lifting in terms of going out into the marketplace to find the solution. It's working, and we're pleased that other power-based CIDs have been able to replicate it. We started with installing UPS on the perimeter cameras, then moved on to key internal cameras, and have now completed the installation of UPS for all our cameras, with this large stage being financed from our surplus, which I'll come on to talk about. A reminder that the cameras on the perimeter are generating alerts 24-7, those in the interior just in the hours of darkness, except with the, with the exception of a handful of hotspots. And this is purely to manage the practicality of the alerts that will be generated if the analytics are running on the internal cameras through the daytime as people go about their business in our area. Deep Blue is also contracted as the response provider for our entire area. That means regardless of whether or not you pay them to attend to your private residential alarm, if you see anything concerning or suspicious in our public spaces, they should be your first port of call. So please save their number on your phone and encourage those who work for you to do the same. SEBSID continues to make a monthly contribution to both Community Crime Prevention and Hout Bay Neighbourhood Watch in recognition of their respective efforts to reduce crime in Hout Bay. In addition, we pay CCP a very modest fee for ad hoc periodic testing of our cameras, which entails people moving around the area, both internally and on the mountainside at night, checking that the cameras detect them as they should. So on the topic of public safety, uh, we've updated these charts, which we first presented last year, and this first one shows serious incidents reported to CCP WatchCon over the past six years. And we're using CCP WatchCon statistics simply because they're far more comprehensive than those compiled by SAPS, because many smaller incidents don't reach SAPS. People don't want to lay a charge, but most people in Hout Bay are inclined to report something that happens to CCP WatchCon. So as you can see, there had been an extremely encouraging downward trend in crime um, until this year, both in Scottish State and Barbianskov and the broader Hout Bay. Um, but that picture has changed quite materially this year with, with an increase. Um, regrettably, we've had uh, five residential burglaries within Sebsid, one at a property on Wood Road at the junction with Main Road, one at a home that was being renovated on Bavians Close, where access came from the military road path, and three on Avenue Suzanne, all within just a few weeks of each other. On Avenue Suzanne, two were actually at the same property, and one was the house next door. All three of these were carried out, we believe, by the same gang or crew based on the information CCP has. It's clearly very concerning, and each incident has shown up some weaknesses in our security network, which have subsequently been addressed. This gang is exceptionally well organized, very cognizant of the workings of CCTV surveillance and its associated monitoring software, and prepared to sit for literally hours outside a property waiting to de determine whether the response has been alerted or not before they inch forward. In terms of action taken in reaction, Deep Blue and CCP works extensively with Hikvision, who is the manufacturer of the cameras and monitoring software, to make several technical adjustments in order to try and prevent this recurring. Hikvision themselves were taken aback at how smart these criminals are. Um, and Deep Blue have now installed your very late. <laughs> Sorry. Good evening. For those who may, just in case anyone doesn't know, this is our ward councillor, Roberto Quintus. Thank you for joining us, Roberto. So, in addition, Deep Blue have installed an additional camera in the area at their own cost, and Sebsid is also adding an extra camera. But just for some context, we looked at the same incidents for the whole of Hout Bay, and while it by no means justifies the increase in crime that we've experienced, it does illustrate that this trend, trend has occurred across the board. From each incident, a lesson can be learned, an action taken, for example, tweaking monitoring software or adding a camera. But each of these incidents has also highlighted the importance of property owners taking every possible step to secure their own home, particularly during construction or renovation. Sepsis, cameras, Sepsis camera network is just one of the layers of security deployed to make our neighbourhood safer. Homeowners, particularly on the urban edge or elsewhere in our perimeter, need to also ensure that their boundaries, their property boundaries are secure 
have beams, alarms, and ideally electric fences in place and ensure that access to the home itself is difficult. Just updating again the second chart that we showed last year, this is the other relevant reported incidents to CCP, uh, the vast, vast majority of which pertain to suspicious people or cars rather than actual incidents, but again, shows quite a marked in increase on last year. And obviously, if you look at the overall headline reported data from CCP, the incidents are much, much higher, as it includes things such as medical reports, municipal incidents, people calling in fires, etc. Moving on to environmental improvements, this remains an extremely, portfolio, extremely important portfolio for SEBSIDs. On a day-to-day -day basis, Andrew Preen's team maintain our public open green spaces, and it, it really is, I've always said, it's wonderful that Stephen and Henry, who were brought in by Andrew at Inception, are still our same two dedicated staff. I know a lot of you have come to know them. I know they've come to take real pride in looking after our area in which they now feel very invested. Between their gardening work, clearing out stormwater drains, collecting litter around the area, on average, around five bucky loads heads to the dump each month. Over and above the day-to-day -day work, there's a never-ending list of other projects being managed. We're regularly trimming vegetation or trees to ensure the cameras have adequate visibility, removing biomass, which has been dumped, removing fallen branches post storms, etc. And obviously there was a significant amount of work to be done uh, post the major storm we experienced in September. A substantial removal of invasive trees has been carried out by the City of Cape Town Invasive Species Department this year predominantly in the River Corridor and some along Bobby Arnscliffe Road. Sebsid is also in the process of the complete, completing the removal of the stone pines along Avenue Suzanne, which posed a fire risk. And everywhere the trees are removed, whether by uh, Sebsid or by the City of Cape Town, Sebsid plants in their stead, generally sourcing trees from the City of Cape Town's arboretum at no cost. Um, thanks are due to the residents who water these new plantings for us. It's not only invasive trees which we're removing and replacing with indigenous species, also plants such as prickly pear, cactus and syringa where they occur on public space. The area around the scout pool has been a particular focus of late uh, due to the way, well, maybe I shouldn't say this here, but due to the way the storm water runs off from the fields of Prunadale Primary School, the area immediately adjacent to the hall was always underwater in times of heavy rain. The decision was taken to embrace the situation and create a natural wetland. This was facilitated by the removal of substantial vegetation, which was being used as shelter by vagrants. The space is still evolving, but is already vastly improved from an environmental perspective. Periodically, we need to undertake substantial clearing of vegetation along our mountainside perimeter and above Fountain Drive to ensure cameras have adequate visibility. This process has just been completed and will be repeated as needed. We already talked last year about seeking approval from the City of Cape Town for our ongoing rehabilitation of the Barbians River. It's important to stress here that the work being done is entirely within scope of the CID's mandate, but we ideally would like to have City of Cape Town's formal rubber stamp of approval and frankly take advantage of input from their in-house experts. But the wheels turn exceptionally slowly at the City of Cape Town, so Sebsid's work continues based on the detailed guidance we saw from eminent experts in this field. The recent immense downpour of rain in the storm of late September validated the work done to date to provide runoff plains in times of excess rainfall, but more is needed. Sadly, several homes in our area were flooded, and the importance of keeping the river and its tributaries clear of alien vegetation and unauthorised structures cannot be overstated. We were delighted by how well the path along a section of Bobby Arnstaff Road was received and would like to extend it, but clearly this is not prudent when many of the water pipes are about to be replaced and the impact of that work is clearly quite destructive. As we've said, we would like to install paths in other high foot traffic routes, one easy one being Darling Street, which is well used by dog walkers and others, and that is earmarked for next year. We'd love to create a path on Andrews Road, which is a very well trekked road by workers, dog walkers and schoolgoers, but space is a real challenge. Planting and general beautification has been front of mind in recent months, and Andrew's done some wonderful work, as has Michelle of Sun and Soil, who oversaw our indigenous planting beds on the green belt at the corner of Darling and Scaife. Not only did these make the local newspaper, the City of Cape Town Parks Department recently inspected, and they look set to steal our idea. Right, so do you need to break? Uh, I just wanted to run through a few photographs, a few examples of the work that has been done here. Um, the one on the left there is the steps um, at Union Street, which actually do need a little bit of, uh, of replenishing of those wood bark, uh, wood chips. Um, Jemima, what's the one in the middle? I couldn't remember. 
Uh, those are the steps that Coral closed, thank you. One on the right is the area by the scout hall where we've moved a lot of the vegetation um, where all the vagrants were sleeping. It really was a quite an awful mess, much cleaner now. Uh, on the left of this one is the wetland that's been created by the scout hall. I'd encourage you to go and have a look. It really is a, an excellent piece of environmental improvement. Middle section is some planting of trees right at the very top of Andrews Road. One of our owl boxes going in on the right hand side. Thank you to everyone who's hosted those. It's been very popular. The lovely bridge at Coral Close, which enables uh, everyone to cross the river, regardless of how the water, how high the water is. And finally, um, some planting on Avenue Suzanne, replacing those stone pines that were removed. Turning to uh, the third pillar, urban maintenance. Um, this is always the artist of our portfolios. And the main point to make here is um, that when it comes to logging service delivery requests or C3 requests, as they're known, all residents must please log the request themselves in the first instance and take note of the reference number. And only if an undue delay ensues should this be passed on to the CID to follow up. And if you don't know how to log a service delivery request, please just head to our website where all the information is there. Uh, finally, the demarcated parking bays in the cul-de-sac at the top of Bobby Arnsmith Road have been painted in by the city of Cape Town and seem to be working and solving the problem that was occurring there with selfish parking. Uh, and at the request of local residents, we installed two more traffic mirrors, this time on Hugo Avenue. Social responsibility. That's going to be a cheeky one. So when, when the steering committee brainstormed about our business plan back in oh, late 2018 um, and how we might meet our social responsibility portfolio requirements, I don't think we could ever imagine the number of wonderful causes we've been able to support. These include ongoing financial support to the Hout Bay Volunteer Emergency, Emergency Medical Service, the first aid training program where we regularly run refreshers for our trained volunteers and run new first aid level one courses to uplift others in Hout Bay. SEBSID funded a substantial renovation of the Hout Bay Museum Hall, which was very much in need of a facelift. We continue to fund the reading program for learners from local high schools, which is organized and hosted at the Dennis Goldberg House of Hope, adjacent to the museum. Through Bright Start, we sponsor Minently from IY in her education at Valley Pre Primary. SEBSID is one of the sponsors of the Darcy Sunshine, Fa Sunshine Foundation Anti-Drowning Program, which is facilitated in Hout Bay by Hout Bay Swimming Academy. And there are several smaller, other smaller one-off supports, such as a new sink for the staff, uh, staff room at Sentinel Primary, assisting with some Santa boxes for Hangberg Educare, some Christmas hampers for the Hangberg, Hangberg Seniors, um, and we still support the IY Ukapila cleanup campaign um, by giving the team the, the supply of black bin bags every month. That brings to a close the, remark, uh, close the remarks I wanted to make on operations. Um, just to recap on our communication, <laughs> recap on our communication channels, because nothing that the CID, CID does is of any value if any of those, if those of you who reside here and are funding this are not aware. So our regular detailed newsletters are our most important communication channel through the year. These are sent to more than 700 contacts we have on our database and then flagged on our dedicated WhatsApp group, our Facebook page and posted to our website. But if you're not hearing from us and want to do so, please let us know. Now, before I move on to um, the formal business of this evening, two of our, our residents, Peter Channels and Craig Killeen, have been working on a project called Breadwinner, which I like to think might have been inspired by Sebs's trusted tradespeople, but takes it to a new and much broader level. And as members of our community, it would be lovely if we could be amongst the first to give support to this initiative. So we've asked them to say a few words about the project here. That is going to involve another look at my screensaver, unfortunately. So... Ready? Hello, everyone. Uh, Hi, thank you. Afternoon. I'm Peter Craig. Uh, thank you very much for allowing us to steal some time here. Um, Craig and I have been living in Scottish State. We're neighbours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to clarify, um, I've been about since 2015, and I think you 2016. Yeah. yeah. So some years. Um, and we've both been aware of this um, this issue of uh, how do we support our community members better to um, find a way to. So what happened? What the problem is is you've got people sitting on the, the corners of the roads trying to find work, and you know really ably and, and sitting there very diligently trying to find something to do on the one side, um, and then the other side, what we we're experiencing on our, our WhatsApp groups every day is. Um, 
somebody saying, please, can you recommend a plumber? Please, can you recommend a painter? Please, can you recommend a tiler? And every day on all the WhatsApp groups, somebody else replies because they, everybody is actually really vested in finding a way to support these people in our community. Um, and so trusted tradespeople is, it was the first step in trying to say, can we put something together to, to make this happen? Um, and then Craig and I started thinking, how do we make it better? Um, and then that was where uh, this idea came up for Breadwinner, um, where we're trying to connect our community together, the, the broader community and specifically the CID community, um, to be able to support these needs of we, we are looking for people in our homes to come into our homes that we can trust and we want to be able to rely on our community. And we want to be able to create jobs in our community. And, and how do we expand and make the circle bigger? Um, I think that's what we're trying to do, huh? Yeah, he's explained that very well. Um, so breadwinner is what we came up with, with this idea that, you know, we all have these people that have come into our homes and made a difference in our lives, that we want to support them and support their families, and they're all breadwinners and their families, and how can we help them? Um, but basically, it's coming from an idea of we are a, a we want to be a close-knit community in the Scott Estate CID, um, and I want to be able to rely on my neighbor. So when my neighbor says, I love this painter. I can go, cool, I trust my neighbor. How do I, let me go try your, your painter. And then I can come back and say, actually, I didn't like your painter. Oh, I loved your painter and I'm going to recommend it again. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to transform the way we connect as a community and with local tradespeople to make a vibrant platform that seamlessly connects all of these needs. And it, again, it did start with the, um, with that, the website, the page on the website, but it's not dynamic and it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't enable to build the trust in the community. I mean, what we're really trying to build here is a community platform where we can connect with each other. Um, so we've got there. It's not just a marketplace. It's the heartbeat of a connected, thriving community. <laughs> um, so there are a couple of, so what currently happens, what are the pain points of how this is currently happening in our community? Um, so there's several WhatsApp groups. And there's several hundred people on these WhatsApp groups. <laughs> and there's some people on some and there's some on the other. And every day somebody's messaging about somebody that they want to recommend or somebody that they're asking for. Um, and even, I mean, I used to, Craig had one, a guy that he recommended. And then I used the guy and I didn't like the guy, but Craig liked the guy. <laughs> you know, that gets confusing. Yeah. So, um, so the, the whole system is very, very inefficient um, and it's, it's not working. And then, you, you know, so I've now recommended my guy and I remember, oh, three days ago, somebody said there was one about a landscape and then I try to go back and find it. And was it on the CID group or was it on the Scott Estate group? And, you, you know, it's, it's, it's such an inefficient system and you get information overload because you can't remember who did what, who recommended what. Um, uh, and you know, it's difficult to find, it, find the information back when you're trying to find it. And then the last two points are things that you don't really consider. So, um, like privacy concerns. I don't know who all those people on that WhatsApp group are. And now I'm taking this complete stranger's advice to invite somebody into my home. Like, how safe is that actually? And, you know, how much, you know, can't we rather build up this trusted network? And then the same thing on this, there's a lack of accountability. If, you know, if, if I'm recommending someone, you must, I must make sure they're good. Because um, it's, it's giving a, a leg up to everybody. So there's so many things that aren't working with the current way that uh, we, we're trying to support each other and our breadwinners. So Breadwinner aims to streamline the process, enhance the organization, and create an efficient and trusted platform for community engagement. It's very much driven around community engagement and a, a community view of how us, us as a community can come together and support each other. So... Our vision is to say goodbye to these inefficiencies and welcome everybody to Breadwinner. Um, we want to enhance community engagement and streamline the way we connect. Um, and we're very excited to introduce Breadwinner in its very, very early forms. <laughs> um, and what we're imagining is a dedicated platform designed to overcome these challenges of, of the current system and the current pain points that everyone's experiencing. But it's not just it's not just the solution, it's this community driven revolution <laughs> that puts the power into our hands um, and enables us to transform our communities. Uh, so we're just going to give you a very quick overview of, of what um, Breadwinner looks like, um, of where we're trying to get it to, and we by no means here at all yet. Um, but basically uh, what happens is that uh, community members would join the, the what this Breadwinner platform in the same way that you'd have to join your CID. 
and we'd have to verify you so that we know that these are people in our community. And, and when I engage with somebody on here, I know these are my neighbors. And it brings that level of trust and that brings that level of community engagement. Um, so once you're verified as a community member on our platform, then you can start recommending this, the, you know, the gardener that's been working with you for 20 years who really needs an extra day on a Tuesday and you really want to help them or, you know, the, um, the painter who came into your house that did the most amazing job and wants, you know, needs more money to send his kid to school. Um, and you can start putting on these people that have helped your life and, and you can start transforming their lives in a very transparent and accountable way. And then once they've come, you know, you've used, you've used the platform and you've experienced the person, you can then create reviews because that's the step that's missing in the way that we currently do it. There's no accountability and feedback on how good I am at recommending breadwinners and how good these breadwinners actually are. Um, and it, it enables, you know, the ones who are good to continue performing um, and just kind of have a much more dynamic system than what we currently have at the moment. And it's free. <laughs> so this, so at some point we want to get to make this a sustainable venture. But right now we're just trying to solve the pain points and we're trying to build something that serves our community um, and enables growth in our community. Um, so Craig and I both have full-time jobs and we're doing this in our spare time and we don't totally know what we're doing. So we're working it out as we go along. Um, but the vision is building something for our community together with the community. Um, and everybody's going to win. I think I've labored that point quite a bit by now. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> what I really liked about this is if we had this live system that was working, we wouldn't need people standing at robots anymore waiting for work because that's such an inefficient way of trying to find work. I'm not going to ask that guy into my house. Um, so they don't need to stand at the side of the road. They can go be part of their community and they can go spend time with their children and they can outreach in their communities knowing that the work they're trying to do is going to get provided for them. So we're coming for a call to action. That's what today is. <laughs> we had hoped that by this point, we would have this amazing app up and running with you for you that we could send out and um, just start rolling. And then we got deep dived into it and we realized, really, we don't know what we're doing and <laughs> we're going to have to start slower. Well. <laughs> <laughs> We've got wonderful ideas and we, we haven't yet got to the point where we're implementing them. Um, but so what we, what we just want to start with right now is we want to start building up this database. Uh, and so we're asking people, we, we've got this really beautiful form that Craig is totally spearheaded, um, just to start with saying, who are you in our community? And if you've got one or two or five breadwinners that mean something to you, please put them, just fill in the form. It'll get onto our database. And then once you've got that database, we'll use that to then build something that you can use. Um, that sounds about right, eh? Yeah. So I think um, maybe a good way to explain it as well would be a sort of Airbnb setup where you've got that trust built up on both sides. So it's about the breadwinner also being able to feedback what they thought about the person that was providing the work as well. So it's a two-way thing. Um, and as Peter said, right now, what we really want to do is just get that spreadsheet going with all of these people on that we can verify and and then just take it, work it from there because, you know, you can spend millions on apps and they might not work. So what we figured, we built a really great tool, which we're going to release tomorrow that you can go onto your phone or onto your laptop, click on the button and just start entering those breadwinners. And then we'll start piecing it together uh, and, and really just take it from there, right? Yeah. So um, please take the time to fill in the information and, and then from there we'll build something beautiful for the community. Is there any, and I think we've done our time, huh? but yeah, if there's any questions, questions please, uh, please, if you've got any questions. Yes, we won't, we won't give away um, residence yeah. information. Oh, about the breadwinner. Yeah, so what we will do is they'll we'll go to them and say, would you like to be part of the platform? And if so, do you consent to us sharing the information? So we're just trying to get the information at the moment, and then uh, we'll take the next steps of exactly privacy is incredibly important. Um, and putting it into a platform that's user-friendly is also our next step after that. I think we've also got a, a very detailed document of how all of those security issues have been addressed. Um, 
and we can share that as well. And if you're interested to go through that document, just to see how we've thought through these different aspects of it, um, they are all there. Um, as I said, we haven't built the app, but we can start with the spreadsheet and work our way from there. Um, but each breadwinner would have to have an initial referral from somebody, and then they would need to come up with a second referral, Then those referrals would be checked. Um, and then they've got a process that they need to go through to uh, upload ID documents and things. So by the time they come on, they should be, yeah. Ooh. Very important. Yeah, yeah please check. Oh, <laughs> all right. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Um, just to confirm that we do have. It's not promising. Hello. Uh, just to. Oh, red light, probably going to run a battery. So we've got 27 registered members in the room. So um, we've already caught it with a problem for the purposes of the minutes. Um, I might trouble you to go and find the gentleman just to check what we do if this runs out of battery, because I don't think that I'm going to have the voice power. Right. So um, now we're going to move on to the formal business of this evening and initially an overview of our financial affairs, um, our audited financial statements for our, our uh, financial year ended June 2023 have been made available on our website and their availability was highlighted by an email to all residents as well as posts on our WhatsApp and Facebook group. So I do hope that those of you who wanted to review have had a chance to do so. But I am going to run through the headline figures this evening. I'll talk about expenditure in our four key pillars, explain the surplus we ended the year with and plans for how a, a large proportion of that will be utilised and then present the budget for next year. So income and expenditure in our third financial year, um, in line with budget, our income was just under 3 million rand. In terms of the core business, I will speak about the individual portfolios in more detail in a moment. But as you can see, core business expenditure was broadly in line with budget, likewise generally. And in a pleasing change of direction from previous years, we are finally making headway with several of our various projects, some of which were always planned and others such as the refurbishment of the Museum Hall, where new causes presented to the board. Um, except the expenditure on projects exceeded that originally budgeted, with the difference being funded from our surplus, as we'll see on this next slide. And this is the detail of the amounts that were released from the surplus and the various projects that they funded. Obviously, all these slides will be available on our website after this meeting for anybody who wants to look at them in more detail. Turning to the core business, our public safety expenditure is very close to that forecast, despite us having a much larger network of cameras than originally anticipated. And this really is testament to the cost efficiency of our contract with Deep Blue, which, as I outlined before, is on a, on a per camera basis for the end to end solution that they provide. Most notable variances in this portfolio uh, in the portfolios are seen in environmental improvement, punch, punching well above its weight. There's definitely a few people in this room responsible for how wonderfully busy this portfolio has turned out to be. You know who you are. Um, and urban maintenance punching well below, reflecting primarily that while we budgeted for measures such as speed bumps, etc., the reality is that City Cape Town simply will not grant permission for their installation, regardless of whether we offer to, budget, uh, to fund it or not. So back to the thorny issue of a surplus. And I know that sitting with a surplus is something um, which is uncomfortable for many homeowners. As I've explained at every AGM now, a portion of this reflects the fact that in the very early stages of every CID, expenditure takes time to reach a normalised run rate. Over and above this, SEVSID has had some very specific constraints on its budgeted expenditure, predominantly in the removal of alien trees and improvements to the Hout Bay Common. At the end of our last financial year, so this time last year, we were sitting with just over 2 million around in cash. Uh, and thanks to the majority of us being such dutiful ratepayers, we received um, a rebate of 166,000 this year, reflecting the difference between the 3% bad debt the city retains and the actual underpayment. So that results in us having just over 2.2 billion in surplus funds. As I will come on to explain, in this current financial year, the board does have confidence it can finally to commit to more of the projects which have been budgeted for historically and will now begin and now be funded from this surplus, which should be, begin to make a decent dent in the number. 
And here is the outline. Um, sorry, and just, just a reminder that uh, over and above that, the city does require us to um, retain a provision equivalent to two months of our income as a protection against unforeseen cash flow risks. So moving on to the projects, which, as I say, we now intend to finance from the surplus. The first is, is already committed, and that's the completing the rollout of our uh, battery backup to entire camera network, which I mentioned earlier. Um, as I said, the installation has been in three stages. Stage one was mission critical, so to speak. Stage two with the cameras next most important to keep online. And both of those we were actually able to finance from uh, our ongoing expenditure. Stage three, this final tranche, is the one that we're financing as a ring fence project under just over two years, taking us to the end of our first five-year term, with the intention being to budget for this cost going forward on an ongoing basis into our second five-year term. Although, of course, that assumes that the members vote in favour of a second term and that load shedding is still with us. The project for alien tree removal reflects partly some of what we've been thwarted, with, uh, thwarted in trying to achieve thus far in terms of removing trees in accordance with the relevant legislation, uh, which the City of Cape Town Parks Department has simply not historically been amenable to. Uh, but now we do have some changes in that department um, uh, in personnel, which means that, the, that things are looking a lot more promising. Also, the continuation of some projects, namely the two gentlemen, Kenisa and Sikalela, who work two days a week in the mountainside above us, constantly removing alien vegetation, uh, both with a view to uh, obviously removing those invasives, but also uh, mitigating fire risk. And they also work a third day uh, a week for the Friends of the Rivers of Hout Bay, which subsid funds. Also in this project is the cost of the planting already undertaken, where invasive species have been removed. So Hugo Avenue, Avenue Suzanne, the corner of Murray and Andrews, for example, multiple locations along the river, and those to come in the future. And also um, clearing that we undertook to the extent that it was possible of some of the plots below the military road pathway where many vagrants unfortunately reside. Um, unfortunately, there's also a lot of milkwoods there, which, meant, which limited the extent to which we could clear, but where we could, we did. The river rehabilitation, which I mentioned earlier, um, at every step here, we engage with the relevant departments of the city of Cape Town who periodically uh, attend to inspect. And finally, our, our Houtbay Common, Again, some costs here have already been incurred, namely the creation of the wetland, which I've talked about, also repairs and maintenance, which we offered to undertake to the bandstand. Beyond this, further planting is on the agenda, the restoration and revamping of the one kilometre running track, potentially some more environmentally appropriate adult gym equipment, um, and the long-awaited skate park. And yes, honestly and in truly, we are close to breaking ground on this. Um, documents have been submitted to the City of Cape Town in the past two weeks, which should genuinely move us forward um, to be able to get this project off the ground. Um, maybe not in this financial year, but I do dare to dream we'll achieve it before the end of our first five-year term. Assuming we spend all funds as allocated to projects, what happens to the rest of the surplus? Well, as we've said before, having a financial cushion in the event of unforeseen adversity in terms of public disorder, given where we live, is never a bad thing. Our business plan and budget has always aimed to provide for the means to move residents out of the area should an emergency need arise. We're grateful we've not had to date needed to deploy funds for this purpose, but knowing we have the monies on hand to bring in a medical helicopter, for example, or tactical response is an invaluable resource. Moving on to the proposed budget for next year, uh, firstly a reminder that this is comparing what we are now budgeting for next year versus what was originally budgeted for year five when the plan was drawn up in 2019. So quite a lot has changed in the interim. No change at the, the headline level, it's obviously just some of the allocation between the different budget lines. And really on the specifics here, the only thing that's, that's notable is that depreciation is considerably lower as we never actually installed um, a gate at the top of the Bavianska Road has, been, has had been envisaged, envisaged. And I say this every year, but general expenses are much higher reflecting that our original budget for a full-time administrator became a part-time role based on a con uh, paid on a contract basis. In terms of the individual line items in the core business, revisions are a function once more of the fact we now have a more finessed understanding of where budget is required. Public safety, always the single largest line item and largely unchanged versus um, the original budget for this year. Quite a meaningful increase in budget for cleansing and environmental improvements since we just do so much more in these areas than we originally envisaged. And a slightly reduced allocation to social responsibility and more meaningful uh, reduce, reduction to urban maintenance as I said, a quiet, quiet portfolio for us. Um, 
As part of the proceedings this evening, uh, we asked members to also approve the implementation plan. Um, that's the plan that formed part of the original business plan and budget. It's revised twice a year to reflect progress. It's literally a step-by-step -step guide to how we're planning to, uh, devise, to deploy the business plan. That's available on our website. We also ask you to approve the re, uh, reappointment of our professional advisors or auditors in the form of Harry Curtis and Co. Ros Akis of Accountant as our accountant and Alison Lowe as our company secretary. As per our memorandum of incorporation, a third of the board must resign each year but may stand for re-election. So Chazelle and Alison have stepped down but been re-nominated. Keith Cronwright has also stepped down but for personal reasons, very sadly, is not standing again. Keith has been on this subsidy journey from the very beginning. He was an original member of the steering committee and a staunch supporter of the board throughout. He's been the most regular host of our board meetings over the years and always perfectly catered with snacks and wine and ever happy to allow the board to stay and chat once the formal proceedings of the evening were completed. We're all very disappointed that he needs to step aside and wish him well, and we're sad he's not with us this evening. SEBSID has always advocated a board of seven, and we're delighted that Alex Schwager has accepted a nomination as director. I'm not going to make him stand up, but he is in the room. Uh, Alex has been a Bobby Answer president for five years. He's one of our trained first aiders. He's an active member of the community, already being admin of the general and emergency WhatsApp groups. And he's recently taken over as the Neighbourhood Watch area leader for Scott Estate and Barbary Arnscliff. The board would be delighted to welcome him and we hope you will support him with your vote as we intend to. And now on to the exciting new addition to the agenda. Um, this is the proposed adoption of the amended mem memorandum of incorporation from the City of Cape Town, updating the existing MOI, which has been in effect since 2014. Um, this has, in fact, been years in the making, and there have been extensive discussions around its drafting, and all active CIDs have been involved in those discussions, um, all of which, of course, is dull in the extreme to the average person, unless you happen to have the misfortune to be a CID director. Um, the City of Cape Town um, has provided the next few slides for us to run through, um, which summarise the key changes in this new MOI versus that which we currently abide by. I will page through them. Um, but as I do so, I'm just going to highlight what um, are the really, really key changes that we as homeowners need to be aware of. Again, all of this will be on our website, which is on our website for you to review in more detail. So firstly, the quorum to require, uh, one of the three key points is that the quorum to re required to establish the meeting has been reduced from 20% of members to 10%. Um, which is presumably to the fact uh, that many CIDs struggle to achieve a quorum. That's something we're very proud that we've never suffered whatsoever. You're a very engaged community, and we're grateful for that. Uh, there's an, an entirely new clause which states that a homeowner's membership status will lapse if they do not attend a meeting, an annual general meeting, either in person or via proxy for two consecutive years. Um, that being said, should they, this occur, they may immediately reapply, but the obvious in, intention here is, is to increase engagement. And lastly, and probably most, well, actually for us not that significantly, but probably one of the, for some CAIDs, the most important change is a change to voting weightings. And it's spelled out here, but I also just wanted to show it to you in a, in a tabular form, which may be easier to understand, is that the principal change is that while previously one vote was allocated per 5 million of municipal property valuation, this has now been increased to one vote per 10 million of municipal property value. A further change is that any owner of multiple properties with individual values below 5 million will now have the value of all of those properties aggregated and be allocated one vote per combined 10 million. So, for example, if you own three properties, each of which is valued at 3 million, prior to the change, you would have had three votes. Post the change, you'll have one. This really isn't that relevant for our area, given our municipal property valuations, and it's much more pertinent to CIDs who have large densities of either small properties or sectional title units whose ownership might be concentrated in just a few hands. Oops. So finally, to summarise um, voting on the forms, I might have left a couple of things off that slide, I must admit, but I'll talk it through. On the forms that you were handed as you arrived, please mark with a, in the box to either approve, object or abstain on all the items on the sheet. And that is the proposed budget for our fourth financial year, i.e. to the end, uh, sorry, the fifth financial year to the end of June 2025. The proposed implementation plan for the same year, the approval of additional surplus funds used for this financial year, the proposed new MOI, the reappointment of our auditors, 
the reappointment of Alison as company secretary, and the election of the board members. Um, before we move to questions, um, I need to say a few words about my role as chair. Um, many of you will have read my letter of the 6th of September announcing my intention to step down. As I stated, it was not a decision I wanted to make by any means, but my family had reached a crisis point. To say that the response to my announcement was overwhelming is an understatement. Um, my partner eventually encouraged me to just sit down and count the number of emails, calls and WhatsApps I received, which at the last tally was around 240 people who reached out to offer their support, which is truly incredible. And I simply cannot express how grateful I am for this huge outpouring of community backing. There were also many legal minds in the community who reached out to office, offer some guidance as a result of which there is now a legal process underway, which is not at a conclusion, but I believe does offer the prospect of commitment from this individual to not abuse my public role as chair of SEBSID as a means to harass my family. Whether we'll ever be able to achieve peace in our private lives remains to be seen, but if a firm line can be drawn between the two, I am more than willing and keen to continue as chair. So in short, for now, it's business needed. Yes, you did a lot to talk me into it as well. <laughs> so in short, for now, it's business as usual. Should that need to change, an appropriate announcement will be made. So thank you, everybody, for that. Now we'll move to questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest that if you ask the question for the purpose of the recording, for anybody who can't be here this evening, I'll just summarize your question and then answer it. Um, so any questions? I'm sure there must yes. The problem with drones is the legal situation. So they have to be registered with the Civil Aviation Authority of South Africa, um, which is a lengthy and expensive process. You have to submit flight plan flight plans to the Civil Aviation Authority. You're also not allowed legally to fly over private properties, but obviously we could patrol the mountainside. It's something I can assure you, if any of you know Rainier at Deep Blue, he, he absolutely adores technology and would love to use any means possible to improve public safety. And he looked extensively into um, the use of drones, but even to the extent of who pilots those drones, they have to be pilots registered with the Civil Aviation Authority, which just made the whole deployment simply too expensive. And reality is that until these incidents that have occurred, we have fortunately experienced very, very little. Um, it is, to everybody's understanding, it is the same gang. They're a very well-known gang. There is sufficient video footage of them from the incidents for those who know these people to identify them. They operate seemingly throughout the Western Cape. Um, they shift from Iwai to Kailicha, and depending on where they're based at any one time, they then carry out their criminal activity, I guess, in relatively close proximity. But um, we have taken, certainly the measures that they have employed to gain access has been a wake-up call for a lot of us, certainly in, within CID, but even technology experts and safety experts. So we've made some quite material changes to, um, to the software and the analytics, um, as I say. But I cannot reiterate enough that it is just the first layer. The cameras we have on the mountainside are the first layer. The fact is that when these guys have evaded the cameras, Getting access to properties has been incredibly easy. There's been no, there's been fences that were easy to be cut. There's been no beams or alarms on the properties. And in both instances, they've walked, or in all three instances, they've walked in through unlocked doors. Um, so, you know, we, we can do our best in that first layer, but it is, it does fall to, uh, to everybody else to, uh, to step up. I didn't actually repeat your question, I'm sorry, but the, the question was whether drones have been investigated as a means to improve security. So the question is that um, there has been, obviously, as, as we saw in the stats, there has been an increase in daytime crime. There's been a couple of muggings this year on our streets, which we hadn't experienced at all last year and very little in the past. Um, I think we all know um, 
on bin day um, how active the area is. And so uh, the question is, given that we know that the ingress of the people who are committing these kind of petty daytime crimes is predominantly from the main road, what scope is there with talking to city planning to then reduce the amount of access that we have? Um, it is definitely a challenge how open our area is. Um, given that we, as, we have two schools, we have a scout hall, we have a lot of places that require public access. It's, it's certainly an avenue that we could investigate. I'm not quite sure how much we could close off. Um, I mean, we have such a broad area that is open. We've then got the walking path through Merlot. Everywhere that is open, we do have we do have cameras. And for example, on the military road pathway, which is a big ingress, the cameras along that pathway do trigger alerts in the daytime because although quite a lot of people walk their dogs there, it's not as many to make it unmanageable. But the cameras at the main entrance point to our area, the cameras, for example, in the park by the old bowling club. I mean, if you've, if you've ever been in that area, it's sort of eight o'clock in the morning and seen the number of people walking to work. It's just totally unmanageable for the control room. Um, I think we can have a conversation and see what we can do possibly to, to limit access. And as you, it, oh, it went. What did you say? Oh. It's just had some first, it looks like it's just had some first aid. Um, obviously, we, we, as you know, Gabby, we did, we did, we did, come on, we did, bye bye. Hello? This shouldn't be your job, though. Okay. We did. Oh, this isn't working. Is we did investigate. We did explore the opportunity of having guards patrolling. But guards is, I know this may sound a bit dismissive to say, but it's, it's the old-fashioned way of providing security, guard huts and, and people. It's also the single most expensive because for every individual that you want, if you want a 24 24 hour guard then you need three of them to allow for shift changes and holidays and unfortunately in a lot of instances they're just sleeping or they're on their phone and in a very high traffic high foot traffic area how do they know who is coming in to commit a crime and who isn't um and just because somebody looks as if they don't live in the area um you can't necessarily eliminate access obviously if they do commit a crime and then they can be seen, for example, we did have an incident on Wood Road a couple of years ago where somebody was spotted on the cameras. The controllers in the control room do scan the cameras in the daytime hours, and they did once see somebody carrying um, a gas canister, um, which they they had pursued him and he'd stolen it, and he was he was stopped. Hello? It did need first aid. What is it? Okay, hold it there. Right, let's hope that that works. Um, okay, I'm just going to... Right, who's next question? <laughs> the question is whether there's scope to reintroduce neighbourhood watch to maybe have some patrollers during the daytime. There's, there's definitely scope if there's willingness. Um, I think that that's something that our new Neighbourhood Watch area representative should coordinate, um, since he's in the room. But if people are willing to patrol, there is always value in having extra eyes on the street. Um, you're covering yourself in glory tonight. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Alex and I can have, can have a chat about that if there's willingness. But, you know, generally speaking... Not many people these days are, are willing to patrol. Um, it's, it's the, obviously we have the beach patrol that happens and that is very important because there, there is very little surveillance of the beach, but around our streets, um, I think with the cameras, people feel that that has taken the place of, of foot patrols, but in the day, it's a possibility. Any other questions? Johan? So the question is, um, how effective has the camera network been? Which of the, it, where are the incidents where the cameras have picked people up and, and deterred them? So um, we do, I think, it, if I recall, you're not on the WhatsApp group, but what we do on a monthly basis is we summarise everything that's happened overnight, um, what the cameras have picked up and what the response vehicles have done, which is, in the vast majority of cases, just removing vagrants, and it's always the, the busiest on bin, bin nights. Um, 
obviously you can't you can't prove a negative so we'll never be able to say these crimes didn't happen because we've got this camera network now but um in the instance where we, we definitely um criminals have been apprehended um, there was a recent example where um it was actually a homeowner was attacked i think on empire um in the daytime there was a break-in during the day um and the homeowner defended himself and there was an altercation and the assailant was his hand was stabbed and they then were making their way back to presumably IY and came through our area and they were picked up on our cameras because the alert was sent out to everybody because it was a very accurate clothing description and then they were picked up on our cameras and Deep Blue actually managed to apprehend the guy and when he saw the hand wound realized who it was and then um and he was arrested um in this Hundred and seventeen, yes. Oh how many people have, over the so the question is over the year, how many people were found by the cameras? I, I don't actually I don't have to, to the top of my up on the top of my head how many people were no, I could, well I'd have to go back and look through each instance. I must we we don't we don't track crime statistics because we're not a, a resource for people to be reporting the incidents to. So we rely on, on CCP to do that. And each year when we prepare these statistics, as we did this year, we go and we sit with CCP and, and we look through all of the serious incidents reported. And it would be a very easy process to repeat that and correlate it with the camera detection. So I'm very happy to do that for you. But off the top of my head, I don't have a number. So the point is being made that we need to have um, an analysis of the instance the work camera's done right. Paul, you're waving at me. Paul is also, in case you don't know, Paul is also a public safety director on the board. No, but this is where, as I said, the, the problem is that one can't prove a negative. We don't know. We, it's impossible to envisage where we might have been without the network. And I think that something that is perhaps worth looking at, I'm just going to scroll back, which is to look at what, I don't like to make this comparison, but if we look at the statistics for the broader out bay, where you can see, um, and this is, you should, this is a question you should actually go and chat to CCP about, because, you know, they, they do everything that happens in Hout Bay every single day, and they will tell you that without question, the CIDs that have, take responsibility for their own security have much fewer incidences, but I don't have it statistically, and I'm not going to pretend I do, so I, I can get that. But if, for example, we had two street robberies, there were 69, or year to date, in Hout Bay. Um, we've had um, five residential robberies, there's been 14 in the broader Hout Bay, um, there's been 76 residential burglaries. The difference between a robbery and a burglary is the robber, a, rob a robbery is where there's no contact and a burglary is where there is contact. So obviously if, if you have to choose, robbery is the better option, but you know, so, sorry, that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Um, but yeah, so 90, 90 residential break-ins across the whole of Hout Bay uh, versus the five that we've experienced. So. 
I mean, I do believe that the um, that the camera network is working for us, and I think it's very important. I think it's reassuring that we, when we presented the business plan to you in February 2020, we talked about a network of 100 cameras, um, and we were budgeting for the amount that that would cost us. We've now got 117 cameras, and the budget hasn't changed. And I think that uh, if we were sitting in a situation where we'd had to deploy a great deal more cameras than envisaged and put more money into it, it would be concerning. But I think the network that was planned, the, the number of cameras has changed, and that 117 belies the fact that by changing some of the IRs to thermals, it's distorted the number a little bit. But I'm, I'm very pleased that the cost of that is no, not in the least bit materially different to what we originally planned. Yes. Go. I just want to use an element of our uh, environment so we like sharing many times about what we call the text in the way that we want to say we can do the text and so on. So it seems like um, I don't know whether it is and um, I'm not on this. So uh, the question is really what's happening within our environment, both in terms of. Oh, it, is there an element of our CID that maybe focuses on, on the environment and how that impacts on wildlife? Yes, if there's a lady in the room. If I was to give her the microphone, none of us would get out of here. Um, and, but the good thing is I know she doesn't like talking in public. But seriously, yes, Jemima loses sleep if she sees a light at night in the area um, because of the impact that that has um, on, on our wildlife. So um, there was, we have a dedicated WhatsApp group that focuses on biodiversity in this area. And a member of that group, who I also won't know, was in absolute apoplexy at seeing a hardy dog picking at the river um, the other day. So it, it's, it's a really big focus. And that's, that's also, I'm delighted it's been the case, but that's why the, partly why the environmental portfolio has become so much larger than anticipated combination of removing invasives, combination of reducing fire risk, and also about trying to encourage the wildlife that should be here to come back. And the porcupine is a great one of that. And I don't know, if you, if you go and take a walk up Scape Street and you look at the gate that we put in at the servitude by um, Scape, at the corner of Scape and Campbell, I said to Jemima the other day, why is there a dirty great hole underneath it? And she said, that's the porcupine. So we, we blocked his way, so he's dug himself a hole, to, or she, to get through. Yes. So the urban maintenance, I mean, I, I cannot answer it, but feel free to add, Rob, but the, the city of Texan just now has a stipulated policy of not introducing additional traffic calming other than around schools. And, uh, well, okay, then I won't answer it. <laughs> more. Always, more. always more, yes. You're going to have to hold that. I, I don't believe I need this. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, and firstly, Helen, and to your team, uh, a very good, uh, very, a very well done job um, over this uh, term of the uh, SEDSIT. Um, you must all be commended um, in terms of your devotion, diligence, uh, and passion for doing a rather thankless, a thankless job. Uh, you know, I, I put my hand up for the job that I do, but at least I get paid for it. Whereas um, everyone else is doing it purely uh, as, uh, voluntarily and uh, suffering quite often times a great amount of abuse for it. So uh, I think Helen and the team actually need another round of trailers before we continue. But before I answer that, that very simple question, I'd just like to make one or two remarks about Sedsit in general. 
and that is a uh, you know, there's always the expression, uh, uh, you know, uh, the government for the people. And an organization like SEX that makes me quite scared as a politician, because in, it looks like you could have a government by the people uh, in an instance like this. So, uh, you know, the, the city has been where possible. Um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned changes in the parks and recreation personnel. I, I quite literally fought tooth and nail for about a year and a half to have one of our previous a superintendent for parks exiled to Atlantis uh, in terms of the area that he now operates in uh, because of his uh, inability to uh, just be, be productive and proactive and assisting. So uh, in that, Helen, you, you, uh, you and I are both very happy. But where there has been, in terms of urban management or the urban spending, uh, Helen referenced largely the traffic calming interventions, largely speed humps. Um, that were being uh, budgeted for by the sets of implementation. So why would that have happened? The city has a, 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 a traffic calming policy, which means that where there are schools, uh, parks, or uh, homes for the aged, or any other place where vulnerable users uh, are using the road, crossing the streets, etc., and where the road class allows, in other words, not uh, two lane. Uh, two, two directional two lane traffic, which is a class, a class one type of road, very difficult to put uh, speed humps there because you'll have uh, freight vehicles, you'll have a, a large uh, public transport vehicles, etc. But when you start getting into areas where the, you, the city wouldn't consider on its urban mobility budget, which I'm going to see for actually, uh, to prioritize traffic calming. Um, then residents and ratepayers can, and I, I'm, I'm paying out of my water allocation now, uh, this financial year for some uh, speed humps in uh, Edward Street, as well as um, I think Albert Road is getting as well, and there's another road that is getting out of, out of water allocation, where residents want to have a, a traffic plan uh, put in, and where the city traffic policy, uh, traffic calming policy won't allow for the city to pay for it, but other residents can ship in and do it themselves, like a SID, or the ward councillor can contribute funding from his allocation or her allocation. The SEDS had focused on how much does it cost to install speed humps, and let's budget for those speed humps. So there were, there was quite a significant amount of speed humps that were being budgeted for. But once the traffic calming engineers come and do, or traffic engineers come and do their assessments, there are some roads that even though uh, Simpson could say, we're paying for it, so what's the problem? Or the ward council say, I've got an allocation, I'd like to spend it. If the road, either because of gradient or, or possibly because of the, the road network and how it is in terms of what roads may connect to it, uh, line of sight, the other reasons that can be provided, which were extensively provided, uh, will sometimes bar the installation of those speed humps, even if they're done at the rate payers' expense. So that is largely the situation uh, in, in, in the Scottish state area, because of course we have to look at um, not only the, the request from those who want it, we have to also consider the impact of what those traffic calming interventions will have on road users in general, when they have to start uh, potentially uh, slowing down on, on, on an uphill, then getting over a speed hump or whatever it might be. It, in terms of the, the road network or road uh, road usage for, for driving motors in general, sometimes it isn't necessarily the right fit uh, for that to be approved. Uh, so that is largely an engineering decision that is made by uh, people far more competent than I am uh, to, to design traffic networks um, and traffic on interventions. Yes, and that, the, the gradient was the issue. And so the, the reality is, it being perfect, perfectly frank, when we originally devised the business plan, when we knew from the urban management survey that was done in 2019 that a lot of people were concerned about speed on the roads in our area, um, and it is the results of that survey which informed the business plan, and thus we budgeted to um, try and install some speed humps. Did we go to the level in our business plan of talking to the engineering department of, uh, in, in the roads department to determine whether it would be permissible? In all honesty, we didn't. Um, and so one, one could argue that was a, not a level of um, 
granularity in the research that we did, but we then discovered that because of the gradient and also on Barbianskov Road, particularly because there are already speed humps where you've got a certain gradient, you can only have a certain number of speed humps. There's gotta be a distance between them. Um, and so the, the gradient was really our big problem because we also talked about Andrews Road, Murray Road, um, all the steep roads. Yes. And yeah, thank you for that, uh, Helen, as well. The other, the other point is that where there is already a prevalence of speed humps, the South African National uh, Roads Act requires that there is at least a, a particular distance that one will travel before one gets to the next set of speed humps, as Helen was speaking. But so all of that together with primarily the gradients of Bucks Estate and Bobby Ansberg, which are uh, obviously quite steep going up the mountain. Uh, it's just what was conducive from a, a, a programming, an a traffic engineering programming perspective to put the speed humps to, to improve them, even at the expenses of the rate paying of the cities. Well, you're still, still at your expense anyway, just as your additional expense. I think we haven't So that was a large proportion of that budget. So uh, that was a large proportion. The speed humps were the biggest part. Of the it was a yes. significantly large part of that budget. Yes. yes. What, el what else did you want to address, Johan? So, what other areas were there? No, so within, within urban maintenance, it was always anticipated to, to deploy the funds on. Um, on traffic calming measures. And what we've done in that, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get to the side. What we've done in that portfolio is literally, um, we've just put in three traffic mirrors. We've also done a little bit of repairs. Um, the guardrail at Darling Street at the bridge that was damaged when the City of Cape Town Invasive Species Department took down a tree, we repaired that. And so where, are, yeah. So for example, we had originally envisaged when this budget was set in the very initial stages, we allocated 120,000 to this portfolio for this for the year any June 23, and in fact we spent 11,000. So the significant. So in a nutshell, maybe I didn't explain it properly. In, in, a, in a nutshell, the significant portion of that budget was allocated for traffic calming measures. Traffic calming measures, for the reasons given, were not approved by the city, even though steps that were prepared to pay for themselves, the permission was not granted because of the various traffic engineering conditions that are explained in detail. Nothing really to do with traffic, but kind of You have lots of children who get on a skateboard mm. and they can scream down the hill. Now, when they scream down the hill, they don't understand driving. And they run, they scream down in that with lights. And they're very nervous. How is when they to stop? So that the question relates to children skateboarding down our roads and what can be done to address that. And I think it's addressed to Roberto, not me, I hope. Yeah, so, <laughs> so um, I think it's quite, uh, without, without sounding uh, trite or facetious, one asks where are the parents? Because primarily the first person in terms of child safety should be the parent or guardian of that child. They should know where their child is and what they are doing. So if it's a young child left unsupervised on a public road, that is a potential risk for disaster. But unfortunately, an entire community can't be a parent, and certainly government can't be a parent uh, for, for every child. So that is the first uh, conundrum, is why is the child on the road unsupervised, okay? Number two, there are a host of bylaws attached to that uh, about sort of escaping on the roads. The reality, though, is that the uh, every everything, including uh, your sepsis, the city of Cape Town, and everywhere else, is stretched for resources. But to have a law enforcement or a metro police officer or a traffic police officer present in every area at all times to watch for all offences, it's just not viable. It's, it's not possible. So that also limitation of resources makes it difficult. And thirdly, even the, the most uh, sort of ridiculous component of it all is that the South African uh, Child Act does not even allow for a major police officer or law enforcement officer to put a hand on mm -hmm. a child unless there is a social worker present. 
uh, you as a child, a, a child agency uh, social worker. So even the enforcement thereof, in terms of grabbing a kid, putting them in the police back of a van, trying to find where mom and dad are, and saying to them, do you know where your child was? He or she was being skateboarded down a very steep dangerous road. You need to, you would be mind having a conversation with them, it's not safe against anyone else. Uh, it's quite limited because that child is not able to be uh, sort of uh, put into the back of a van without a Western Cape or national government as both uh, sponsored uh, social work accreditation. Mm -hmm. We've had quite a few kids getting hit in Hot Bay. Hangberg is particularly the worst for it. It's certainly not a unique. Um, it's certainly not a unique situation to Scott Strait. Hangberg is absolutely the worst. Uh, with kids coming down, and there they are extremely large raised pedestrian crossings, and the kids literally fly over them in their skateboards. Um, it, it's it's a it's a very prevalent issue all over, but it really boils down to where does where do parents or caregivers step in, and and whose whose responsibility is it to mind children, uh, and in what case can you and and what enforcement measures can be put on a minor. Are extremely limited under South African national law. Um, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I'm 45, so I might not be the oldest person in the room, but I'm certainly not the youngest either. Um, I remember having a, a very a very real sense of respect for law enforcement officers because when I was a kid, you could be put into the back of a van and taken home for lighting firecrackers, something that you shouldn't have been doing. Those that unfortunately yes, is not possible anymore. I'm conscious you need to go, don't you? No, that's fine. Is there any, uh, while I'm here, I'm happy. I've got a few lot of people tired. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, Rob, I think I know you do have another engagement this evening. Yes. And so I think if anybody's got any questions that they would specifically like Rob to address, we'll take those next. Otherwise, we'll thank him for him time, his time. There you go. And I, I do think that, you know, also you've thanked Sebsid, but I think Sebsid owes you a, a debt of gratitude as well. You, I don't imagine many of you. We get we get immense support, immense support from our, our councillor. He is always available. Every time we go to him with an issue where we're not getting what we need from the city of Cape Town, he always steps in. He tirelessly he's worked on progressing issues that we've struggled to progress. The skate park being one good example. Um, and you know he also runs a WhatsApp group for the the whole of Hout Bay where he has representatives from each area to deal with issues that affect whole groups of residents. And I'm the representative for Scott Estate and Bobby Arnscliffe. And every single time that our water goes off, when I ask you for a reference number so I can escalate it, that's really just a euphemism for saying, Rob, the water's off again. Um, and well, he... It's called the Platinum Call Centre. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, and Rob is on that group, available 24-7, whether it's weekends, whenever. Um, and, you know, a lot of what we're able to achieve in terms of the communication when there are issues is really down to you. So we are very grateful for that. Great. Thank you, everybody. Excuse me. I've got one one more uh, work thing to do before I get to go. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Rob. Any other questions? That's great. Yes. So the question is, um, uh, we're approaching, the, well, getting closer to the end of our, our first five-year term, and then we'll we'll consider a plan for the second five-year term, and, and how will that be conducted? So the process is that um, the board would draw up a proposed business plan and budget for a second five-year term, and present that to the community to be approved at the AGM this time next year. Um, obviously, if anybody wants to, uh, if anybody's got ideas or issues or suggestions, that we're always open to those. As I mentioned, what informed the original business plan was the survey that was conducted, which was very uh, comprehensive and detailed. And we took the, the survey basically said to the community, what, if anything, would you like to see improved in our area? And what those answers were, what, what then um, has informed the business plan. That process doesn't happen again when we come to renew, but of course, Everybody now knows who the board is. We're established. The door is always open. The, the second year business, the second term business plan will look, look a lot like the first one because it will be a continuation of what we're doing. But if there's something that someone feels very strongly that we haven't addressed 
thus far, then please come to us and we're very happy to consider it. Obviously, it needs to fall within the remit of the four pillars of expenditure that the CID has a mandate to, to spend and has to classify as a top-up service to those already being delivered by the City of Cape Town. If there are no further questions, at 19.28, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you for coming, everybody.